For the next 30 minutes, we will explore the unexplained. From mysteries beyond our galaxy, to ghostly phenomena in our own backyard, we will dive into our psychic abilities and explore everything from conspiracies to the just plain weird. Welcome to 30 Odd Minutes. If the truth is out there, we will find it. But only by sheer accident. Yeah! Hey! Yeah! Bravo, bravo! Thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome to 30 Odd Minutes. I'm Jeff Belanger, your guide through the mysterious and unexplained world of instrumental transcommunication tonight. It's a topic we've covered before, but not like this, not with this person, and not as you thought you knew it last time we talked about it when we thought about thinking about it this time. Follow me? Good. All right, great. Hey, you've been sending us emails, Twitters, tweets, Facebooks, MySpaces, and a few carrier pigeons. We appreciate all of it. Not the pigeons so much. Kind of messy. However... But tasty. But tasty. That's right. You want to slow cook them. Garlic rub. Delicious. Delicious. Okay, if you're watching the show live at 30oddminutes.com, jump in the chat room because Oddbot3000 and Sarah and Rob, his best friends, are waiting to pass your questions up to our guests, to myself, and you can communicate with us. You can email us at info at 30oddminutes.com, as many of you have done. Some of you have even threatened to send stuff that we can, you know, props we can put in our studio. And we will do that if you follow through with your threats and mail it to us. You can get the mailing address in the email newsletter that goes out each week at showtime. You can sign up on our website, 30oddminutes.com. We did get some emails. Sarah, please, what do our viewers want to know? We did. We have one from Dave. He said, uh, you folks should make all of your shows, even way back with the chubby Jeff Belanger, available for purchase, reasonably priced, of course. Okay. <laughs> Chubby's fashionable. Okay, okay. Before, <laughs> after, before. <sighs> okay, no one needs to see that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the chubby Jeff Belanger. Well, thank you very it's much. You they like you in all forms. Ouch, yeah. uh, chubby Jeff from a year <laughs> ago. The camera adds weight. weight. Yeah, the camera adds like 30 pounds. <laughs> That's what I've heard. That and donuts and high-fat foods and lots of calories. So, okay, tonight we're talking about ITC instrumental transcommunication. We're talking about spirit communication. Very big topic, very big subject. And there's people that are inventing all kinds of things. One invention that you may have heard of or may have seen is called the Ovilus. And this is going to be kind of neat. I'm going to interview, and this is probably the first time on television, and I'm going to be so bold as to say the last time on television that an Ovilus has been interviewed on a talk show. Ovilus, can you hear me? How are you today? Stomach. Stomach. I think it's raster. Ra raster. Running. Running. Um, uh, okay, great. And so, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Vector. This is really awkward. Uh, where do you get your influence? I mean, sorry? Magic. Magic. Okay, great. And that's Help. good. And what do you think? Are you a fan of 30 odd minutes? Do you bored. watch the show regularly? Did it say bored? Poland. I really think it said bored. <laughs> oh. 70. 70. Oh. What? Sister. Sister. Remember the time I hung up on her? Oh my gosh, we did that on a show too. All right, well obviously this is going to go nowhere fast. And just 29 minutes more of this to go, folks. No, I'm just kidding. All right. We're not sure how that works, but thank God you're here tonight. And thank God our guest is because he invented it and we're going to talk to him. Our guest is an engineer in robotics and semiconductor industry. He uses microprocessors and electronic skills to solve complex problems. At the age of 47, he was asked if he could build a device to communicate with the dead. At first, he thought that was kind of silly. But on April 23rd, 2007, he tested the device, and the results forever altered his life perspective on the paranormal. He's since dedicated his skills to the pursuit of tangible answers to the paranormal. Here's the thing. You've seen his inventions on the Travel Channel, the Sci-Fi Channel, A&E, Animal Planet, E, and Good Morning America. And tonight, you get to meet the guy behind all of these great inventions. Please put your hands together, live all the way from our studios in Colorado in his house. Please welcome Bill Chapel. Yes, yeah. Bill. Bill. Hey, good evening. How are you, man? I'm doing well. OK, so what happened was someone told you you weren't smart enough to build this thing. And that started a whole paranormal career that's launched since 2007. <laughs> well, you know, I, I actually, 
building things prior to that. But yep. uh, it was the first time I'd ever been approached about the ITC type of thing. Okay. Doing uh, spirit communication. So, uh, yeah, basically, long story short, it kind of uh, sparked everything. And of course, one of the prominent theories, uh, first of all, let me say, Bill, I don't think you're smart enough to build me a time machine. So, yeah, you've said that before. Yeah, but not on camera. <laughs> See, it counts now because it's for the record. So uh, let me know when it's ready because uh, I really want to take that for a spin. There's a few things I regret. I'm just going to say that and leave it at that. Okay, so there's prominent theories in the paranormal is that ghosts are either comprised of electromagnetic energy or they manipulate electromagnetic energy to do stuff. Uh, if mm -hmm. that's the case, maybe things like EMF meters, maybe things that can detect those forces might detect this stuff. Are you following that theory? Is that what you believe? Well, I, I think that we see things happen in the EMF field, but I don't think it's a direct manipulation of the EMF field. Uh, kind of you to think of it like throwing a rock into a lake. Uh, the EMF meter sees the ripples, but it never sees the actual event. And I, I think that's what we're, we're seeing. I don't think we actually see the event itself. I think we're seeing the effects. Okay, so, but you think it is in the electromagnetics, well, like you said, the ripples of the pond. I think it, I think it affects the EM field. I don't think it's actually generated uh, as EM itself. Okay, so what's the first device you built to try to see if you could detect this possible paranormal force? Um, well, it goes way back. Uh, I built, uh, actually, I actually did something similar to the obelisk back on the Commodore 64 back in the 90s, but probably handheld devices was the, uh, uh, a pair of um, digital uh, dowsing rods. And basically, it was just an attempt to make an electronic version of what people run around with, uh, just the uh, handheld aluminum or brass dowsing rods. Right. right. And so, but now I remember, gosh, this was years ago. This could have been 2007. I think I had mm -hmm. one of your earliest versions of the obelisk. You weren't there, but the device was there out in Tombstone, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was with uh, Lloyd Arbach, who's been a guest on our show. And we, we'd never heard of this thing before. We saw it for the first time. And we took it outside and we just started joking around. Now, we're in the desert in Arizona. And I remember saying, you know, like, oh, any spaceships here? Beam us up, Scotty. And the thing started saying spaceship, attack, uh, ex explosion. And we just started laughing like, oh, my God, it hurt us, and it's going to laser beam us to death from uh, the nether regions of Mars. So uh, it was interesting that this thing was speaking in context to what we were talking about. Now, the, the obelisk, this is the obelisk one, which uh, I got a couple of years ago has come quite a ways. How does it work? What is this, th what is this detecting to spit out those words? Uh, the premise is fairly simple. Uh, there are two channels in Ovilus, uh, a right and a left channel, just like uh, a right and left dowsing rod. And it's sensitive to EMF. It's sensitive to static electricity, capacitive field ionization. So basically, if you imagine that you're getting some type of manipulation within the environment, you get a reading that goes up, uh, the energy level changes, the obelisk senses that, and it says a word based on that energy level. And it's always been very simple. It's always been a one-to-one -one relationship. There's a dictionary in the obelisk, and it just uh, takes the words and goes, if the, if the value is 100, it says the 100th word. If the value is 1, it says the first word. And it works like that every time you turn it on. Um, I think people think it's too simple to be that straightforward, but that is exactly the way it functions. Now, here's what's so interesting about this. I've seen the device. Uh, I, I have one. We've, we've taken it out. We, I've seen it at lots of paranormal events and conferences. I've seen people use it. Now, folks, you heard it in the very beginning. That voice is kind of difficult to understand. We, you know, we, we thought it said boring you know, at one point. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's what it said. Uh, ouch! Oh, zing! Man. Uh, so, uh, so you know, but but that's that's part of the magic of this thing is that it's open to interpretation. That's the nature of a lot of spirit communication communication tools. And I remember sitting down with you years ago when we talked about this. I, when I saw the obelisk, the first thing I thought of was the Ouija board, the talking board. You know, um, 
sometimes the message isn't very clear, but that's, what's, that's the beauty of it. That's the magic of it. It is open to interpretation. It's not supposed to be crystal clear. And, uh, and right. people are hearing all kinds of things. If you go on YouTube and you look up the Ovilus, you will see tons and tons of videos of people communicating, or, or at least they believe they're communicating. Do you believe they're communicating, Bill? You know, I've seen some things that people have sent me over the last several years that, uh, you know, I definitely have to sit and brow. But, uh, you know, the obelisk was just one attempt. I also have paranormal puck. Right. And instead of just speaking, it actually prints out in text uh, what is said. And, and I like that unit better, the paranormal investigation, because then you actually get a chance to say, okay, I said this and the response was... You know, and right. then you look in, is it, is it concise? Is it quick? You know, those are the things you're really looking for. Right. Understood. Uh, Bill, we do have a question for you in our chat room. Rob, what do mm -hmm. inquiring minds want to know? Yeah, we have a question from uh, Ramaik or Ray Mike. He, want, he wants to know if you or what you think about psychograph. For the last two years, he has been getting words and numbers and dates in his photos at his home. He thinks his house is haunted. So psychographs, the idea of, uh, I guess, paranormal photography. Uh, do you think the camera, the regular camera, is, is picking some of this stuff up? Uh, you know, Jeff, I don't discount anything at nah. this point. Uh, you know, and I, I'm going to be fairly politically correct in saying no. that. Uh, yeah, I don't, think that, I don't think it's out of the realm. Uh, you know, we've seen it across the spectrum. ITC seems to work no matter what medium. Uh, I think the big key when we're talking about this type of communication is that you have to have a person that is actively participating. Right. And, and the person is such a key ingredient to anything paranormal. That's the interpreter, the human, the living human. So uh, tell me, what happened on April 23rd, 2007? Okay. I had built the forerunner to the paranormal puck mm -hmm. and agreed to go out and try it out at uh, a conference in Waverly. In Kentucky. Waverly Hills, San Antonio, and, yep. Yeah, I was having trouble with it. I wasn't still, I, I mean, I had, was writing the software on airplane flight out there and finishing it in the hotel room. And actually, during the, the pre-event, uh, I was sitting there working on the software. And it was stuck in a loop, and the device kept saying the word water. And it said it like thousands of times. And I finally fixed the software and got the problem straighten up and the first thing it said was lake water friday night you die now it was kind of like a death threat and the thing is is i had almost drowned on three trips just prior to this and uh you know so it was kind of like a ominous tone uh that entire night i saw this device do things i was just not ready for and uh you know I was expecting it to be a joke, pretty much, you know, it's going to say something, somebody's going to go, oh, you know, and, and it's going to be fun, but uh, it did things I absolutely was not expecting. Right, and so one of the questions that comes up is, uh, if the electromagnetic field is involved, is it affecting our perception? Now, that brings up the God Helmet, which people may have heard of the God Helmet. Uh, it's a device where you're basically voluntarily pounding your frontal lobe with electromagnetic energy. I've done it. <laughs> Uh, Bill, I did it. I uh, I did it in Bill's hotel room, in the interest of coming clean. Thank you very much. We were in uh, we were in Waverly Hills, Kentucky, a couple of years ago, and I tried this thing. Now, uh, let me just explain what I went through, and then you can explain how it works, Bill. So I put this thing on. Isn't that great? I didn't even ask questions. I just said, Yeah, I'll try it. <laughs> no wonder I can't walk near microwaves anymore. Uh, but uh, so you put this device on. It's it's kind of like a, a strap with with some electrodes. And then um, ear, earphones, where I was listening to a, a lulling kind of like woo, 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 woo sound. And then sunglasses that had red LED lights that were flashing, but I kept my eyes closed. The idea was just pulsating light, pulsating sound. And then you just lay down and relax. And believe it or not, it is very relaxing. You've got this, this very lulling noise, very, you know, very much like in the womb. Not that I remember. I recall a little. And you see what you get. Now, I can tell you the experience I had, and I probably did this thing for maybe 15 minutes, maybe a little bit less. Uh, at one point, I saw a scene. It was just a street. It was a street with cars moving, but it was a street I didn't recognize. And that's it. 
I'd love to tell you something really profound, but that was it. Just a street that I didn't recognize with cars moving and it looked very modern day. So, Bill, now that it's been a couple of years, what were you doing to me <laughs> during this experiment? Well, you know, conventionally you explain most of it. We're just taking and, and creating a magnetic pattern on your uh, temporal lobe and trying to induce some type of uh, experience. Uh, rather than the, the classic devices that have been built previously, the uh, God helmet I built actually is driven similar to the Ovilus. In other words, instead of just going down a, a pre-programmed pattern, the environment actually sets the pattern. The idea originally was to take uh, someone that is uh, proposed to be a psychic, mimic their patterns or the environment there, and, and see if we can't duplicate it with another person. And so by, and maybe that electromagnetic energy would, would kind of charge up that portion of your brain if it needs charging, um, which is interesting because then you've also got devices like your EM pump. Again, people, mm -hmm. if they believe that electromagnetic forces, you know, people talk about batteries draining when, when paranormal stuff's happening, things like that. Uh, well, if that's the case, if they need energy, then you've got this EM, EM pump that's providing it. Well, the EM pump is, it does provide a limited amount of energy. The idea behind EM pump was a little different. Uh, if you'd imagine, like, when you're driving in your car and you hear a siren behind you, uh, it breaks through the monotony. It rises and falls outside of normal background noise. Right. Uh, that was really my idea, it was more of an attention getter, uh, because the EM pump sweeps from, like, 0.5 hertz up to 250 hertz and it cycles through constantly. So it's doing two things. It's putting some energy into the environment, but it's also creating a white noise similar to the way a, a siren would work. And, and, it, and so out of that chaos possibly comes order? Well, I don't know if order is the thing. You know, okay. if, you're, if you're really believing that something's there and they're able to manipulate, interact with, or change the EM field, uh, it's kind of like a beacon. You know, you're going to turn it on and it's kind of more like, uh, hey, look at me. Because you got to figure we are permeated with 60 hertz noise across the planet, 50, you know, in uh, Europe. Um, every type of RF imaginable. So there's got to be, if you are listening to the EM spectrum, there's just a tremendous amount of background noise. So what this device does is it creates like a siren. <clears throat> it's different. It's going to break through the monotony because it's going to raise and lower and continually change. It would get your attention. Right. Understood. Bill, hold on one quick second. We actually have to take a quick break for a very odd fact. And now, an odd fact with Matthew Moniz. A 10-gallon hat only holds three-quarters of a gallon. Isn't that odd? This has been an odd fact with Matthew Moniz. Oh, thanks, Matt. We haven't had those. Yeah, we haven't had those in a while. Oh, an odd fact. Good to know they're still around. And a 10-gallon hat, not 10 gallons. Probably could have guessed that. Good stuff, good stuff. Uh, Bill, we do have more questions for you in our chat room. Sarah, please. We do. We have one from Ann Jasper. She wants to know how you feel about devices uh, that people invent that they either don't market to the public or they don't make them available to the public. Well, that's a good question. So yours are for sale, so we know what you stand to gain. But what about uh, devices that aren't for sale? Do we trust them? Well, <laughs> that's a difficult question. In fact, Jeff, I think a lot of people don't know, but uh, I'm going to actually shut down hardware production at the end of August. And it's really more of a type of thing that you're never going to get rich in the paranormal field. Uh, I made a lot more money as an engineer than I ever made as a paranormal inventor. Um, I, I think I like the idea of getting it out to multiple people because then we know what the results are. You know, when you've got a thousand people testing a device, I think you've got a little bit more credible test bed than when you've got one person saying, look at, you know, look at what I've done, look what it does. Right. 
And so you're moving, and you already have some of this stuff available as uh, applications for the iPhone um, and the, the yes. iPad, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. yes. In fact, yeah, there, there's one of them right now. Check that out. Which one are we yeah, looking at? Look, that's the uh, EMX, and it's a, a three-axis EMF meter that reads out in milligauss and nanotesla, and you can, uh, it'll, it'll track the minimum and max. So when someone does an EMF sweep, you just reset it, walk through the room, and then write down the results. Right, so you're looking at highs and lows of the EMF field. You also have, Sarah, come on up. Don't forget the microphone. You've got the uh, Ovilus. Look at this. Yes. Get real close. <laughs> real close. So Sarah, Sarah downloaded this on her. OK, ready? Hello, Ovilus. Frank. This is the second, the second. Now, what's cool about this one is it actually, the words come up. So you can see the words, not just hear it. And the voice is a lot clearer. So mm -hmm. you know what was in this device. You know, you, you built it. But what, what are you tapping into? in the iPhone that, that does the same thing? Well, that took a lot of work. Um, you know, the GSM circuit that's in there, it, which is basically your, your uh, uh, interaction between the cells and cell towers, there's a lot of information available to the phone, and that's the first place we went to to uh, start getting some, some type of sensory feedback. Uh, the iPhone has several sensors in it. You've got a capacitive touch wow. sensor on the phone, you also have an accelerometer, and then 3GS, we have a full magnetometer. So uh, the new version of the iPhone makes use of every sensor in the iPhone. And uh, it took me about, oh gosh, I think it took me nine to 10 months to get that about as close as possible to reacting as the original. So there's nothing these iPhones can't do. So we've been getting 360 door, mean anything to you? No. <laughs> we. Oh, she's getting a phone call. I got it. Let me get this. Matthew Moniz. Hello, hello, Matt. We're on a show right now. We're a little busy, dude. Could you? Could you? Whoops. Call back later. Could you? Could you call back? This is awkward. Thanks, Matt. All right. Thank you, Sarah. So very good. So you've got you've got this amazing iPhone thing, the the iPad, which actually we got to play with a couple weeks ago in Long Island. So this, this device is tapping into the stuff that's already in there. I, I'm just amazed that it's got things like there's an EMF meter in the iPhone? Yes. Um, and some of the new uh, Android phones I'm just starting to work with, we even have temperature sensors. So about the only thing we don't have is relative humidity and barometric pressure. And uh, probably if I do any hardware in the future, it'll be an add-on module for the phones to be able to throw in uh, those two uh, variables. And so you've got now some of the stuff, you know, when, when you're producing, when your production level is the kind of production level that you have, where you're making maybe a few hundred of these things, these things mm -hmm. are pretty pricey. But when you're talking about the iPhone apps, you're looking at like $1.99, 99 sure. cents. All of a sudden, it gets real inexpensive, provided you have the iPhone, of course. So, um, you know, so that's, pr that's pretty cool that just watching the whole evolution of this and a very quick evolution, only a couple of years to, you know, to, to this point already. Right. I've got uh, seven paranormal apps out currently. Um, I think I've got like six more in the works. So my goodness, uh, I've got a got a, a new one coming out for fans of EVP that has the fast way transform and spectral analysis built right in. So you can do everything, and then when you're done, you can just have it send it to your server or email it to your house. <laughs> That's so cool. I mean, you know. Paranormal investigation for the iPhone generation. Bill, we do have more questions for you in the chat room. Folks, we're going to try to okay. get as many as we can. Rob. Yeah, this one um, is about your apps, actually. A uh, slime goat wants to know if you plan to make your apps available for the Android, which we just mentioned. Yeah, will it be available for the Droid? Yes, uh, just started porting for the Droid. Um, there are some issues with the Android. It's open as a platform. It's, uh, you've got so many different manufacturers and so many different phones. It's going to take a while to make sure that the app performs the same, like on, uh, you know, so many of the different flavors of phones that are out there. Uh, where the iPhone, you've got a couple different generations of iPhone, but you don't have 30 different manufacturers of the iPhone. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Good question. We knew that question would come, and there it was. 
Great stuff. Okay, so a couple weeks ago, we were in Long Island working on an actual paranormal investigation, and you had a camera with you. Andy, if we could bring up uh, number six. Uh, this camera, it's, it's a, a multi-spectrum camera um, that mm -hmm. is viewing all kinds of stuff. We're going to show it here in a second. There it is, behind me, <laughs> in front of me. Okay, a little tough to see. Talk to us, Bill. What, what are each of these four cameras looking at? Okay, from uh, left to right, uh, the first camera is set up to be uh, UV sensitive only. The, and right below that camera is a sweeping field system that looks uh, in the uh, thermal and ultrasonic ranges. So we're looking not only for visual cues, but uh, also auditory echoes at the same time. So that's, that's three different things are happening in the array. Uh, the next camera over is just visible light, just a standard camera. Right. The the camera in the immediate right of that is a uh, infrared camera that goes up to about uh, 1,200 nanometers, down to about 1,200 nanometers. And then to the far right is the MagCam itself, and the uh, MagCam trips off of changes in the EMF. And now, what's interesting is when we were on this investigation, not much was happening in general. But the MagCam was actually kind of tweaking. It was going bright to dark. Um, you know, we, we saw this happen multiple times in a short period of time. So it's interesting. And that's, uh, that's a view from the MagCam, correct? Yeah, that's a, a promo photo. Right. It's very cool, by the way. <laughs> okay. so, so the whole idea is that we're, we're trying to see more of the spectrum. If this stuff is happening just outside of visible light, then maybe we can detect it. Maybe we can look into UV and ultraviolet and infrared. Um, maybe we can see the magnetic field. Interesting, really interesting stuff. iPhone app for that? I mean, come on. Well, the MagCam is the iPhone app already. Right, uh, we're already right. working on MagCam Pro. MagCam Pro will allow you to interface to a lot of the digital SLRs. So you'll be able to use one iPhone app and trigger almost an unlimited number of cameras on an investigation simultaneously. So if you're in a room and you put your iPhone in the center of the room and you put like 10 of these uh, digital SLRs around in the room, every one of them will take a picture simultaneously based on the feed out of the uh, iPhone. That's amazing. Because one of the complaints that I've heard a lot of people talk about recently in paranormal investigation is that this equipment is getting so expensive and people are getting brand loyal like oh no you can't have this you got to have the the k2 you can't have the you know this meter or that meter you need you need this stuff that's starting to cost a fortune FLIR cameras you know that are uh, you know thermal imaging cameras you know these things are can cost ten thousand dollars and so you've got you know you've got all kinds of people that that look feel like they have to spend all kinds of money to get on paranormal investigations and what's cool is it, it's great to see how quickly it's coming back down to just you know, simplicity, the experience, but then also all these apps for the iPhone. Of course, again, you got to bite off that iPhone, but it's a lot cheaper than a FLIR camera for sure. Um, so, well, as time goes, Jeff, every phone you're going to see is going to be a smartphone. Sure. Um, it, it's just the change in the cell phone market. So, you know, as things change, try and keep pace with it. So, we're getting near the end here, Bill, but I want to know uh, kind of in the last minute or so. What do you think? You've seen all these ghost hunting shows have your equipment on uh, most of the time. In fact, just about every time you don't get credit. It's just, yeah, you know, our scientists, you become like this generic mad scientist that people talk about, uh, you know, works on this stuff. What do you think when you see your stuff on all these popular shows? I, you know, a lot of times I really like it. It's a lot of fun to see people use it. Uh, one of the things I've got the, the greatest amount of fun out of is when I'm just out somewhere and someone's doing an investigation and they'll actually come up to me and show me what they're working with and have no idea who I am. Right. And uh, that tickles me too. Yeah, right. I mean, gosh, Good Morning America. When, you're, when your equipment's on uh, Good Morning America, my, you know, you, you're pretty close to, a, to have making it. So, uh, so well done, sir. We yeah. appreciate it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, very good. Bill, we will have uh, links to all of your stuff on our website at 30oddminutes.com. And want to thank you for joining us. We've, we've come right up here to the end and, uh, and appreciate you spending some time with us talking about all this stuff, where it's going. It's great to have smart people working on it. And until next time, stay odd. <laughs>